It does mean that I'm watching out for the people of South Carolina and I'm watching out for the people of this country. And that's where I, that's where I, that's who I will be voting for on November 8th. Wow. Our next guest says this is the lesson to every working American building off what the governor just said. Here to explain is Crowdpack CEO and former advisor to UK Prime Minister David Cameron, Steve Hilton. Steve, you wrote a column about this building off the Nikki Haley quote. Why? Because I think that it goes to the heart of the choice that people have to make in the election, which is what are going to be the real world consequences of the outcome for real people. If you look at what the Clinton campaign are doing, basically the whole campaign along, they've just been saying don't vote for Trump because of his personal behavior. You saw even yesterday where she wheels out Miss Universe. There's no from argument. From as well. That's right. There's no argument about his policies, about his tax plan, his support for school choice, any of that stuff. It's just his personal behavior means he can't be president. Now, if you're rich, you can afford to take that view because, to be honest, if you have a President Clinton and the Democrats and more of the same economic stagnation, it doesn't really affect you. Your life is going to be fine. But if you're a working American who's really struggling to pay the bills, you don't find the job opportunities there, you're worried about the future for your kids, you can't afford to have four more years of the same economic stagnation. And that's why right. you've got to put the real impact before personal behavior and really look at policy. You're the professional uh, politico, but if I'm a candidate and, and you, you, I hired you to, be, to, to finish off my campaign and my best closing argument is how bad the other guy is, I think I'm a failed candidate. It's, all they're talking about is how thin-skinned he doesn't pay taxes and look at how he, how he, uh, how he views women. It's really embarrassing if you, if you think about the fact that this is a person, Hillary Clinton, who's basically been, been plotting and scheming for this for 30 years. And right a few days before her big moment, she hasn't got a single inspiring message about the change that she will bring to real people's lives. She's just slagging off the other guy. It's really kind of embarrassing. And I think when people think about, well, when I come and vote and I really have to think about the impact of my vote on real life, that is the key, crucial factor. So many people looked at Donald Trump and said, just prove yourself electable. And he kept tripping himself up. For the last two and a half weeks, all he does is talk about policy. He was getting cheers on policy yesterday and barely brought up emails. Fascinating as we look to see the close of this campaign where most national polls have it within two points. It's, it's exactly right because all along, right from the beginning, when Trump has been talking about the issues and about real change in real people's lives, he does well. And so when you have, like we saw a, a headline in the New York Times not long ago, which is, how could anyone vote for Trump? Yeah, you write there in your column, how could anyone vote for Trump? And you come back is, is that really your best argument for voting for Clinton? That's right. How could anyone vote for Trump? Because they don't want to, they, they literally can't understand how anyone could support a candidate with those personal characteristics. But that's because they don't want to engage in the real argument about what difference is going to be the result of voting for Trump versus Clinton on the economy, on schools, on healthcare, where he's got right. the message of change. And all she's saying is basically you're going to end up with more of the same, right. which has left the rich richer, but half of America earning less today than about 15 years years ago. Who would think a month ago uh, we'd be talking six days out, we still don't know who's going to win. But that is exactly the case. Steve Hilton, good great to see, to see you. you. Right, good job. All right, coming up straight ahead, and we have a Fox News alert, and it's not good news. Breaking right now, two cops ambushed, shot dead in their patrol cars, two separate attacks. Brand new details just coming in uh, from an emotional press conference with the chief of police. And World Series ratings are surging for the first time in a long term protest and a great matchup in baseball. What does the host of Fox NFL Sunday, Mr. Everything, Kurt Menevy, think? We're going to find out. We put a mic on him. I hope he talks. This is a Fox News alert. It has happened once again. Two officers ambushed overnight, shot to death, sitting in their squad cars in Iowa. That's right. Moments ago, a press conference where we learned the shooter apparently still on the loose. Heather Nauer joins us right now with breaking developments out yeah. of West Des Moines. That's right. And it's a terrifying situation for folks who live there and the families of those officers. By the way, we don't know their identities just yet. But we are getting new details about the two police officers who were killed overnight in Iowa. They were murdered while sitting in their squad cars. The suspect still on the run, free to kill again. This happened just outside of Des Moines near a high school. In two separate locations, the shootings occurred 20 minutes minutes apart. Fellow officers visibly shaken. 
In all appearances, it looks just like that, that these officers were ambushed. It doesn't look like there was any interaction between these officers and, and whoever the coward is that shot them while they sat in their cars. Um, that's the best we got that we can explain the scene right now. Um, both of them were in their cars. Wow, this happened at 1.06 a.m. Central Time. Multiple law enforcement agencies are now involved in a massive manhunt at this hour. It is a breaking story. We're just getting in information, and we will bring you all the latest as the details continue to unfold. Customers bracing for gas prices to spike after a deadly pipeline explosion we first told you about yesterday. Alabama now under a state of emergency as crews repair the Colonial Pipeline. One worker was killed and five others were injured when an excavator hit the pipe. Flume of fire, which appears to be a gas line explosion. The scene is still having explosions at this time, cannot access the scene location. Well, that pipeline supplies gasoline for millions of people on the East Coast. A separate leak back in September created massive shortages and price spikes throughout the Southeast. A disturbing warning for all parents, please check your children's Halloween candy. This comes after police found needles and nails inside candy from trick-or-treating. You can see a nail right there sticking out of a Snickers bar. A parent in Michigan says her daughter bit into a thumbtack while eating a piece of candy. That is just terrible. And then in New Jersey, another family finding a sewing needle inside a Tootsie Roll and a small pin inside a Kit Kat. You can't be too safe. Please check it out. Well, the U2 frontman Bono is adding another award to his trophy case, but it is not what you would expect. Glamour Magazine's first ever Man of the Year. Bono honored for his decades of humanitarian work helping the world's poorest women. Well, this year's other honorees include the singer Gwen Stefani, Olympian Simone Biles, and the founders of Black Lives Matter. And those are your headlines. I'll see you back here in just a little bit. All right. Thanks. And Brian would concur. Brian loves uh, Bono. Right. He does not return my calls, which I find strange. <laughs> I do really do. I'm going to have to talk to the edge for now on. Hey, are you ready? Uh, are you ready for some, uh, for some football? A lot of fans are saying we are not ready this year. And it turns, it turns out baseball ratings are soaring. Heading into the World Series Game 7 tonight, NFL ratings are down, and the uh, baseball ratings are up close to 40%. For football, many are blaming Colin Kaepernick when he begins when he started taking a knee during the national anthem. Well, here to react to that is Fox NFL Sunday host and author of that new book, right? Right there. It's called Losing Isn't Everything, Kurt Menefee. Kurt, good to see you. Thanks for being here on the curvy couch. Do you yes. think Come it on, is Colin no Kaepernick's way. fault that ratings are down when it comes to football? No, you know, if you look at it, I know that that's kind of the narrative that's gone out there, but the numbers don't bear it out. But, you know, if you want to look at it and look at it from a factual standpoint, I double checked last night with our Fox researcher just to make sure I had my numbers correct. And when you take a look at it, people say they're boycotting games, and that's mm -hmm. what the surveys say. But the same number of people are watching games that have been watching for the years. They just ha aren't watching as many minutes, as many out-of-town games. If you look at CBS and Fox, which have the hometown teams sure. and show the most games, Fox, at least before last Sunday, was down 1%. CBS right. is down single digits as well. Where the numbers are bad the are those na games. national games. Monday night football, Thursday night football, Sunday night football. Those games have been crap. I think that's part of it. But I do think the election is a large part of it as well. Because if you go back and you look at the years of 2000 when the Gore-Bush mm -hmm. race was close, uh, 2012 and this year are the only three years this right. entire century that the numbers have been down. If it's not up after the election, then I think you've got to so look at other issues. you're saying people are actually tuned into the news channel watching yeah. the news, so you're a little angry at us that we're, we're taking your audience. <laughs> no, because Sorry. Fox, we're doing fine. That's right. For, for football, people are still watching their hometown teams. Right. They're still, if you're a Giants fan and the Giants are playing the Eagles, you're watching the Eagles. Plus, there are I mean, so the Giants Eagles. But you're not watching the out-of-town right. game. That's what happened. Yeah, we won't be watching the Eagles. We'll right. be watching the Giants. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Kurt, there are also so many football games on television I think that's now. A, I think it's a major problem. waters it down. You know, I, here's another thing, too, and I think the NFL really has to address, and, and Mark Cuban hit on it a, a couple of years ago when he, you know, put out the famous line, you know, what, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Yep. The NFL, I think the product, and I shouldn't say this, being a broadcaster of an NFL, from an NFL network, 
But there's so many games on yeah. that when there is a bad game on Monday night or Thursday night, you're like, I got more days of watching. I'm not going to watch this right now and stay here. I've got to dedicate time to my family. And then you throw in high school football on Friday nights and college football on Saturday. You can oversaturate it. And you guys got the Super Bowl this year. Yes, you're sir. the host of Fox NFL Sunday. And Terry Bradshaw considers himself the big personality. We like you better. <laughs> a lot better. Uh, congratulations on doing this book. Thank Losing you. isn't everything. Kurt, you're focusing on people who've had their heart broken in, in sports sometimes a lot of times famously. Mm -hmm. Perhaps people remember this pitch to Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's record. Let's listen. He's the guy who tossed the pitch. Yeah, because that's kind of the focus of the book. I want to go back to people who have been part of major losses or crushing losses and find out how they dealt with it because I think there's a lesson in it for all of us and how we overcome sure. bad moments in our life because we all have it. Whether Everybody. it's at work, whether it's with the kids, whatever it is. And Al Downing was an interesting guy because I grew up an Atlanta Braves fan. And one of my first sports memories was Hank Aaron hitting that home run. I was eight years old. But uh, Downing was a guy who, he was able to handle it fine. He was older when he pitched. He, he was in his 30s when that happened. His mother had died when he was seven years old. And that was one of the things he said to me. He goes, look, my mom died when I was seven years old. He came up in the 1960s, 1960 and 61, pitching in Richmond in the South as a black man and heard a lot of bad things. He goes, so for me to give up a home run towards the end of my career was not the worst thing that ever happened to me. So I was able to deal with it much better than other people were. People around him were the ones that had issues with it. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the book as well, is you find out these moments didn't just affect those that are involved in it. It affected their families and their friends because we're all protective yeah. of people that we right. love when they get hurt. David Tyree catches a ball on his yeah. head. Yeah. Who gave up that catch that enables the Giants to win the Super Bowl and the Patriots to lose? Well, and remember, the Patriots were going for a perfect season. They were going to be 19-0 and if they won that game, and they had the lead with less than a minute left. And David Tyree makes that catch. Rodney Harrison was there trying to defend it. And Harrison talked about the fact that he's in every picture right here yep. that you see of it that it affected him and his family until his wife and his mom snapped him out. But his thing was, was that Junior Seau was a member of that team. And Seau was at the end of his career, 19 years in the NFL. And when Harrison came in as a rookie with San Diego, Seau had taken him under his wing. And so he wanted to win a Super Bowl for Junior. Junior didn't win one that year, wound up retiring later on, committed suicide. It, it, you know, they believe he had CTE. And that affected him more than anything else because sure. that was his friend. And again, it's all about Put it the emotion. In perspective. Yeah, exactly. The it stories really behind the losses. Yeah. Losing isn't everything is the name of the book. Thank you, Steve. Right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Send this you. book to one of the losers next Tuesday. Uh, their whole staff may need a, a few <laughs> of them. All right, Thank great. you. Thank you. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. All right, straight ahead, President Obama pumping up the economy while stumping for Hillary Clinton. We turned job losses into 15 million new jobs. And last year, incomes went up faster than any time that they've been keeping records. Well, that sounds great, but our next guest is breaking down the numbers, and a Hillary Clinton presidency does not look good for the average American's wallet. And what happens when Donald Trump makes a campaign stop at a local Wawa? The reaction is trending this morning. Say it with me. It's fun to say. Wawa. Wawa. Hey, buddy. Hey, Wawa. Enough here. Six days ago, President Obama has been out on the campaign trail trying to get people excited to vote for Hillary Clinton and hyping the economy that he has overseen for the last eight years. We turned job losses into 15 million new jobs. Poverty went down faster than any time since 1968. We've seen an America that went from too many people uninsured to now 20 million people with health care who didn't have it before. Okay, well, he's making things sound pretty good, right? Is it really as rosy as the president is painting it? And what's it going to mean for your wallet if she wins? Brian Brenberg is the chairman of business and finance at the King's College here in New York City. Well, Brian, you just heard the president. That sounds great. <laughs> is it accurate? He's telling one part of the story, but he's leaving conveniently leaving out a few things. He's leaving out the growth in debt. He's leaving out the number of long-term unemployed, people stuck in part-time jobs. He's leaving out the number of people who've dropped out of the labor force. He's leaving out food stamp enrollment. There's another side of the story that he's not telling here. But he did mention health care, but healthcare, I don't know if I would be touting I, that. I wouldn't be talking about that right now. The premium increases, the deductible increases, insurers dropping out of the market, that's the bad news story that's been added to the last seven years of a difficult economy that's really got people thinking about what do I want to see over the next four years. Yeah. When you look, at, I heard Mrs. Clinton say yesterday, my plans don't add a penny to the deficit. Here's some of the stuff on her wish list right now. 
$350 billion for tuition-free college, sounds great. $275 billion for infrastructure, sounds great. $300 billion for family leave, $60 billion for clean energy, although we've spent plenty on that and that hasn't worked out so well. What do you think about that? Well, she says she's going to raise taxes by about $1.5 trillion on the wealthy to pay for that. But you know what? That doesn't even handle the, the deficits that she's already going to inherit. The debt's going to increase by over $9 trillion on her watch. So it's not good enough just to pay for your new spending. You have to pay for the fact that we have all this built-in spending from things like Obamacare that are going to send the debt way up over the next 10 years. And ultimately, don't you think she's going to have to wind up raising taxes and it's going to wind up you, you everybody? Really, you can't balance that budget on the backs of the rich. They're simply not going to pay yeah. for it. They're going to find other ways to invest their money. Uh, yeah, so I think the likelihood is the middle class is going to pay for this one way or the other. Sure, and we heard Ed, earlier in the program, we ran a soundbite where she said, if you know somebody who's uh, going to vote for Donald Trump, you need to stage an intervention. And then she went through the litany of how he used the tax rules to his advantage. Those are the rules. Yeah, you know, it, when you're going to go after somebody for playing by the rules, I don't think you've got a winning argument there. They should be talking about the policy issues. Who's going to grow this economy over the next four years? I don't think more government spending, I don't think higher taxes is a route to do that. All right. Professor, thank you very much for joining Always us. Always good to see you. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, coming up, stunning new developments after email show 10 hack attacks on Hillary Clinton's illegal server in just two days. 10 in two. Lieutenant General Michael Flynn is furious. He joins us in 10 minutes. Then Governor Scott Walker facing a firestorm of controversy for this tweet. Carly Schumke is here with why people think Walker just endorsed Hillary. But did he? I love that guy that flips. <laughs> The internet goes wild when a tweet from one of Hillary Clinton's strongest critics is interpreted as an endorsement for Hillary Clinton. Yep, here with a breakdown of what's trending this morning. Fox News headlines 24 7 uh, key reporter. Ooh. XM 115 is where you find her. But right like now that. she's with us. I Carly like Shimkus, welcome back. <laughs> Carly. We we got to find out what's happening in Wisconsin. Uh -oh. What's going on? Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker's anti-Clinton tweet backfired in a big way. So okay. he tried to make a case for voters to vote for Donald Trump. He tweeted, if you like the past eight years, vote Hillary Clinton. Well, the problem is a lot of people thought he was endorsing Clinton in that tweet, Chris Jackson writes, uh, this is going to be your most popular tweet, but not in the way you hoped. Evan says, I didn't know who Scott Walker was. And as soon as I saw that tweet, I thought he was an HRC supporter. <laughs> and Kevin tweets, I'm Scott Walker, and I'm confused by this message. It, it is <laughs> not a, a good one. It is a little confusing. Maybe there are people out there who like the last eight years, and so they would think. That that's and that exactly a lot of people, meant. a lot of Democrats responded to that tweet and said, thank you for the tip. So right. I don't think that's what he was and looking for. And apparently we are not the only ones that like the Wawa, Wawa. the food at Wawa, Donald Trump, the coffee. his Can daughter, you, Tiffany. Yeah, picture this. You're, sit, you're standing in a Wawa doing some of your normal shopping, crossing off the <coughs> shopping list, when in walks in Donald Trump, uh, his daughter, Tiffany, and legendary Indiana basketball coach, Bobby Knight. <laughs> Amazing. He, apparently, he didn't buy anything, but he stopped to take some pictures. Those pictures are going viral online. Other members of his entourage, though, reportedly picked up some tasty cakes. Wait a minute. You're saying they went in, they didn't buy anything. They just went uh, window shopping at well, Wawa? Donald Trump didn't buy anything. Oh. Personally, you know you always look for what the All candidate's right. going to buy. All right. And, and you, oh, go ahead. I was going to say from Wawa back to Wisconsin. Wawa to Wisconsin. Tim Kaine, with one comment, could have lost the election he made, in that state for his woman. He made a crucial error. He asked a reporter what's a cheese curd oh that's like asking a reporter in pennsylvania what's a cheese steak right you gotta know your food on the campaign trail so uh tim kane responded to the reporter who tweeted about it saying we didn't have cheese curds growing up in kansas city but man have i been missing out oh, oh trying to redeem yeah. himself now this this story does have a happy ending though because okay. he was spotted at a restaurant later that day Eating cheese curds of course he with was. radish, with a uh, horseradish. Well, which I've never had a cheese curd with a horseradish before. You can get it at Wawa. I guess so. <laughs> Well, uh, so so this is a, so. What's the theory then? The theory is know what's indigenous to the people of that state. Yeah, Remember when? Be smart. 
Yes. Sure. Remember when John Kerry was down in Philly and he went to either Gino's or Pat's and he ordered a cheesesteak and he oh, asked for a Swiss sub. cheese. Oh, on it. and he called it a sub, I think, not a hoagie. Oh, he did. Oh, man. It was just there should it was be a, a catastrophe. There should be somebody uh, in your campaign completely dedicated to teaching you the food of that area because Why it not? always becomes a big viral topic if you get it wrong. All right. When in New York, do not eat the pizza with, with a fork. fork. Exactly right. Exactly. All right. Carly, thank you very and much. And know what pizza is. Yes. If you're coming to New York. Exactly. And how to pronounce. It. <laughs> hey, uh, guess who's coming up next? He, you see them all the time introducing Donald Trump at his live events. Now he's going to be with us in studio. How do I know? I recognize the hall. He is Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, and he is here live. Come on over. I just want to While they were just sitting in their patrol cars in two different locations, a manhunt is now underway for a killer. The breaking details in just moments. Meanwhile, six days until the election, and the ghosts of Bill Clinton's past just came back to haunt him and haunt Hillary as well in a brand new October surprise. This one on the first day of November. Not from WikiLeaks, but this one from the FBI. Plus, Donald Trump has a new message for America. It is not too late to change your mind and your vote. This is a good time to make an important public service announcement. You can change your vote to Donald Trump will make America great again, okay? All right, we're alive in, uh, on the campaign trail to talk more about that because your mornings are better because you chose to watch with friends. Fox News alert this morning, a cold-blooded cop killer on the run at this hour after shooting two police officers in Iowa, sparking fears that more officers will be murdered. Both officers were just sitting helplessly in their patrol cars in two separate locations. Yep, the shootings just happened 20 minutes apart near a high school just outside Des Moines. One of the patrol cars was riddled with bullets. I actually used to live three blocks away from where one of those police officers were shot. Now, their fellow officers, while visibly shaken, vowing to find the dangerous killer who is still, at this hour, on the run. In all appearances, it looks just like that, that these officers were ambushed. It, um, on the surface right now, just like I said, we're just a few hours into this, it doesn't look like there was any interaction between these officers and, and whoever the coward is that shot them while they sat in their cars. Um, that's the best we got that we can explain the scene right now. There's definitely some danger out there. There's somebody out there shooting police officers. We hope we find him before anybody else gets hurt. We All the schools in that area, they're shut down today. Sure. Breaking details are coming in by the minute, so stay with us for the latest on this horrific story. Let's bring in Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. You know, he's a big supporter of Donald Trump, been on the trail with him a lot. The one thing, uh, General, that we always notice about Donald Trump, especially over the last two weeks, he reacts is to the news. Yeah. And the news now is law and order. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is unbelievable tragedy. So you got these, you know, two great police officers that, as the, I guess the chief that just said they were, looks like they were targeted, they were ambushed. I mean, the assault on our law enforcement professionals in this country is out of control. And I, I would love to see the leadership in our mm -hmm. country today come out and say, look, this has got to end. Whoever did this particular shooting of these two great police officers, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, as we have gone around the country and, and in the, you know, in this experience that I'm, uh, you know, having with Donald Trump, uh, the law enforcement community is, is, you know, reaching out in such a big way to him because of the, you know, the compassion and frankly, the, the support that he has shown to them to be able to say the kinds of things that we need to say. So this is, this is just another tragedy, another example of the lack of safety that we have on our streets in our country for these police officers, my God. You know, how did the anti-cop narrative get so loud? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it gets loud when leadership doesn't step in, okay? The, the anti-police narrative, the anti-law enforcement narrative, the anti-rule of law narrative gets louder when leadership does not step in. And the leadership at our at the local level, particularly by our chiefs of police, have been, has been superb. It's the leadership from the White House. And you have to, you have to step in immediately when you see this Is assault. it a political thing? It, well, I, you know, I don't, want to, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's a political thing. But what I know is that when we have police officers being ambushed and killed in the streets of our, of our cities and our, you know, in this country, it has got to stop. Yeah. yeah, we need to say uh, a need prayer to, for each of those do. families. We do. We do. And the cops that, that work in yeah. that area, because this gunman's still on the loose. Right, right. 
I, by the way, so, I would love for the just building what you said. I'd love for the president to say something. Yeah, I would too. I, I, I mean, I would, come on. I, I would love for him to say that. Listen, it doesn't matter what color you are. You law and, if uh, right. an attack on law and order is an attack on our society. Right. But let's just pivot to something uh, about this election. With six days left, a couple of things happen. The FBI comes out and makes the announcement about the discovery of six hundred fifty thousand uh, emails. And then yesterday, um, responding to a Freedom of Information Act, they went back to two thousand one and get and get put forward documents about the Mark Rich pardon that. That Bill Clinton yeah. uh, okayed. How important is that? Uh, yeah, it's to all. Th I mean, this just shows the, the the continuation of the incredible dark cloud of scandals that that uh, it, you know sits over the Clinton machine. I mean, this is this. I, I describe this as the largest organized crime investigation, probably in decades, that the FBI is having to go through. You're talking about. You know, the Anthony Weiner pedophilia scandal, you're talking about the nationals, the reopening of a national security uh, investigation against Hillary Clinton, who is, you know, four or five days now away from potentially being a president. Give me a break. I mean, when is enough going to be enough for these people, in addition to the WikiLeaks, in addition to more stuff that's going to come out? I understand that you know, there's, there's talk about the, the quote unquote 33,000 emails coming out today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, the 33,000 are probably in the 650,000. I mean, this, right. this, is un, this is unprecedented. It's unbelievable. You, you know what? You mentioned the emails. Yeah. And we were, we were just learning this morning, Judicial Watch recently discovered that Hillary Clinton's server was the target of 10 hack yeah. attempts in a two-day period. This was back in 2010. And the hackers were trying to log on as different people within her campaign, like Doug Ban and <coughs> Right. What's your reaction? Right. Well, you know, all this stuff. And, and, the, and then the, the things that we are seeing in the email discussions that are coming out, I mean, even those, they're, 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 it's disgusting. This is a disgusting way to run. I mean, I, I would never allow this in any military organization at all. Any, any type of, uh, of the, the, the kind of conversations that are being had in these emails are just, it's unbelievable. I, I would tell you that the, um, the, the, the whole effort that's going on with when they talk about the cyber attacks and the hacking I mean this has been going on for many many years so for any of these people to be talking about what what has happened or wouldn't happen I mean to me this is just unbelievable so so what I mean what we're facing is we're facing a uh, an incredible level of scandal criminal behavior I mean there's there's serious criminal behavior mm -hmm. that that is directly related to Hillary Clinton's and that actions. foundation in the foundation I mean everything you, you know and what? it's you know it's funny but it's all coming together this 650,000 it's it's like Anthony Weiner is going to end up you know tying all this together because he probably was using this as a get out of jail free card well, you, apparently he is cooperating. We right. don't know exactly what cooperating, what the cooperation means. Yeah. But there's a story out this morning that, you know, given the fact that he was sexting, he's in big trouble right. for sexting right. with at least one yeah, underage sick. teenager. Uh, now there's a report that he could have been the perfect target for hacking into her server sure. because his then wife sure. was one of the uh, users. Yeah, I mean, there's two other things here that I think, in, uh, in my my experience with investigations, which we've had quite, a, I've had quite a bit actually in the area of espionage and also just the extortion side. So you have elements here that are so dangerous for our national security because you likely have classified information, highly classified information in this 650,000. So if Anthony Weiner had access to him, that means there are many, many other people that had access to him. Just the president of the United States right. uh, evidently oh, had an, the extortion. The, blackmail. the president of the United States evidently had an alias too, and he was going back and forth yeah. with Hillary Clinton on a private server. But, General, are you when you talk about uh, espionage and stuff that you've been involved in? It does bother me that we're doing this off Julian Assange's hack because this guy's an international criminal. Yeah. Does it bother you? Yeah, it bothers me. But uh, but uh, it also what what bothers me more. It's not about Julian Assange. It's not about Russia. It's not about Anthony Weiner. It's about Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is the one that made the decision to have an unclassified server in some closet somewhere right. to to do government very very sensitive government business for four years. And that's why Barack Obama should be the angriest. I yeah, hired you to do be. a job he and you be. did all this. Now here's the other thing. He should be, but he's but in a way, Brian, he's caught. He's caught because the the, the leaks of information that are that, that are coming out are gonna show unless they unless they pull him for national security reasons, they're gonna show that, that our president was in communication with Hillary Clinton and and in fact he he said he wasn't.
He right. said he found out about it through the media. So sure, and and with the WikiLeaks stuff, this is this is where we are in society with technology now. Yeah. This is like a, yeah. a w the whistleblower of 2016. Right. Yeah. That's right, General. The other thing is that what so makes this so unique. I was thinking about it this morning. Is that if you didn't like Al Gore, you didn't vote for Al Gore. You don't like Bush, you don't like Bush. You didn't like Barack Obama, you didn't vote for Barack Obama. You wanted to find out more information, but it was just let's just find out more information to find out what kind of agenda it'll have. Right. This is different. Yeah, this this is, is what are you hiding? How deep does this go? Yeah. How else are you involved? What do you really mean? How are you rigging the primaries in order to get the nomination? The more you look, the uglier it gets. Like it or not, Donald Trump is so transparent. He got himself in a lot of trouble between his tweets and what he oh, says yeah. and answering questions maybe too candidly. Yeah, yeah. I'm a mean, little too honest, you mean? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, journalism is under attack this this election for sure because there's been so much. Frankly, there's just been deceit in the in the in, you know in your business. And I'm being very frank. This is this has become a social media election, and I'm telling you, sure. you look at so you guys pay attention to it. You you report on it all the time. This is a digital election, and it has changed. And all this leak stuff, it, if it's showing one thing, is that you cannot hide anything. Yeah. And so it's like I've said, I've said it publicly. Hack my emails because I would love to sure. have somebody put out what I say because what I'm saying right here is what I say in my emails. I don't disparage people, like you know, you know all yeah. the kinds of words that we're hearing said in the emails. General, there's a brand new ABC. Washington Post tracking poll that has just come out in the yeah. last uh, 10 minutes or so and apparently uh, on the question of honesty and trustworthiness yeah. now Donald Trump eclipses Hillary Clinton he's in front of her at this point according to what was just whispered, whispered in my ear yeah. I gotta ask you something uh, that uh, Mr. Trump was talking about out on the trail yesterday yeah. he said look you know some of you may have already early voted for Hillary Clinton it's not too late right. to change your vote right how many people, as you go out, have you met or heard say, you know, I wish I, I, wish I could have a do-over on that? Yeah, well, the other, I mean, the other day... Is this a big number we're talking I, about? I don't know if it's a big number, but I think that people ought to have a, a you know, a, you know, I'm glad that those states have the opportunity to show up to the polls, because I guess if you show up to the polls on polling day, right. if you've previously voted, you can re-vote. You can recast your vote, and I guess there's five states. I think that that's a big deal. I, yeah, I don't know what the numbers are going to be, but I think it's going to be very interesting to see what those numbers are, well, to see you, how many people re-voted. If you look at the trends on, yeah. on Google, it is interesting, yeah. because no one's really checking it until right. the latest investigation drops on right. the 31st, all then all of a sudden a spike goes up with people Googling, yeah. how do you change your vote? Right, right, right. So I, I think right. you're going to see a number of people re, you know, recast their vote, and I think you're going to see it. You can't yeah. explain it. Uh, you lived it, and you're getting briefed along with Donald Trump in many cases, yeah. but it's hard to take your eye off what's happening in the world. Yeah. ISIS calling for attacks on the West Coast. Mosul about to fall. We're turning this over to Iran. The challenge is what's happening in Syria. Russia on the march. China beginning to expand. When Donald Trump looks at this, do you sense, does he know what he's getting into? <laughs> yeah, he does. And, and it's, uh, you know, this is an incredibly serious time for the United States of America. And it's a very, very important time for the U.S. to demonstrate leadership. We have such a deficit of leadership right here at home and around the world and that has got to change and donald trump you know that's his his big message is make america great again and his bigger message is we are going to start leading again yeah well a week from today next wednesday morning we'll know who the yep. next president is that's great general right, thanks, thank you general. very much thanks. where are you heading now back out the door uh, no, uh, you go back on the road yeah, with back on the road yeah well. meanwhile i know we're going we're going straight to election day remember six days from now fox news has election day covered all day. Fox and Friends is going to start at 4 a.m. and Fox News will have continuous live coverage through the nights as the votes come in. We know you want to know how every state comes in, so stay here on Fox, your official American election headquarters. Thanks so much, General. Meanwhile, coming up straight ahead, six days until Election Day, and Donald Trump has a new message for America. It is not too late to change your mind. This is a good time to make an important public service announcement. You can change your vote to Donald Trump will make America great again, okay? So we are live on the campaign trail with Donald Trump. That'll be next. Donald Trump is seizing momentum in the final six days of this election, now heading to the must-win state of Florida. The Republican nominee telling early Clinton voters it's not too late to change their minds. You know, John Roberts would probably like to change his mind over this assignment. He said, yeah, I'll follow Trump around. It turned out to be a really crazy ride, and he joins us this morning from Miami.
You, you know what? It's not like getting on one of those roller coasters where you're at the top of the first hill, Steve, and say, oh, was this a good idea? We love it. <laughs> this is the most incredible election that I've ever, no ever followed, and I've been doing every one since 1996. Good morning to you, Steve Ainsley, Brian. Here we are in Miami this morning. It's the first of three stops in the Sunshine State that Donald Trump has got today. He's also here again tomorrow. 29 electoral votes. This is the big prize of all the battleground states, and it really could be said that if Donald Trump loses Florida. It's all over for him. But the polls are looking good. Real clear politics average of polls. He's up by a point. New New York Times poll that was out a couple of days ago has got him up by four. And Republicans are actually leading in the amalgamation of the early vote returns between absentee balloting and in person. He's got a big rally this morning at the Bayfront Amphitheater here along the shores of Key Biscay of uh, Biscayne Bay. Should be a good visual for him if he's trying to get enthusiasm pumped up in the Sunshine State. Yesterday, a big rally in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Donald Trump suggested to folks out there, hey, if you've already cast your ballot in certain states and you want to change your mind, it's not too late. Here's what he said. For any Democratic voter who have already cast their ballots for Hillary Clinton and who are having a bad case of buyer's remorse. Wisconsin is one of several states where you can change your early ballot if you think you've made a mistake. There's actually seven states in total. Here they are, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, Michigan, New York, Connecticut, and Mississippi. The, the deadline in Minnesota passed yesterday. You've got to have it in by close of business a, a week before the actual election. Today, uh, Donald Trump will be go, go, going hard against the Clinton campaign on the FBI reopening its investigation. John Podesta talking about dumping these emails. But of course, as he did yesterday in Valley Forge, he'll be making Obamacare a big issue with so many folks across the country facing double-digit increases. Then he's absolutely the astronomical deductibles that a lot of people are looking at, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars for some plants. You know, Mike Pence yesterday saying in Valley Forge, it's time for Republicans to come home around this issue. The subtle suggestion there that even if you're not fully on board with Donald Trump, be fully on board with this issue. It's one that Republicans can vote on. Ainsley, Brian, Steve. All right. All right. Thanks, John. Yeah, I'm just nice imagining report. all these people who work for the election commission where folks are coming in saying, I want to change my, my yeah. ballot. And they're like, oh, let me go look right. under the case for uh, Shelby yeah. and find your ballot. Oh, I threw that one out already. Sure. <laughs> now, yeah. one state you can't change your mind is Ohio, where you wonder if John Kasich would like to, change, to his, change his vote. Yeah, because he did write in John McCain, mm. which isn't going to count because John McCain is not right. one of the people who's actually... I wonder if oh, he's, he's not running. Did he, no. did he use the same pen he used to sign the pledge to say he would vote for the nominee? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. All right, uh, meanwhile, straight ahead, the president blowing off the latest Hillary Clinton investigation. Has she made mistakes? Of course, so have I. There's nobody in the public arena over the course of 30 years that doesn't make some. Are Democrats in denial? A debate next. Before dinner. Less than a week to go, six days until Election Day, and Democrats are still standing by Hillary Clinton despite her latest FBI woes. Has she made mistakes? Of course, so have I. There's nobody in the public arena over the course of 30 years that doesn't make some. But she is a fundamentally good and decent person who knows what she's doing and will be an outstanding president. So, are some Democrats just in denial for a fair and balanced debate? Let's bring in the vice chair of the National Diversity Council for Trump, Brunel Donald Shea, joins us from Chicago, and Fox News contributor Jamu Green, who was a 2008 Clinton campaign advisor. Uh, good morning, ladies. Thank you both for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Us. God bless you, and God bless America. Indeed. All right, uh, Jamu, let's start with you. Um, we just heard the president say Hillary Clinton has made mistakes in the past. You know, ever since the Comey surprise of last Friday, a lot of people are going, mm, I don't know. And in fact, some of her support has weakened a bit. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> I think that there were 70,000 activists and volunteer shifts booked this weekend for the Hillary campaign. And for mm -hmm. the last four days of the campaign, they have something like 750,000 shifts booked. It's interesting to ask if Democrats are in denial. 
Donald Trump's last salvo to the American people are, one, you can change your vote. Which and is true. two, he's having Mike Pence talk longer than him in Pennsylvania because they're still trying to corral Republican voters. This is a man who looks at preparing for anything, whether it's a debate right. or get out the vote. He looks at it with disdain. What do you do in a campaign? You raise the money, you build the ground game, and now he is trying to find voters, seek them out. The Hillary Clinton campaign, they are turning out their voters. Okay. They've contacted them, they know where they are, and they are focused on that. So there's no denial. It's just the execution and the final days, finally, right. yeah. <laughs> of a pretty well-run campaign. Indeed. All right, uh, Jammu, in a number of states, you can actually change your vote if you have a buyer's remorse. Uh, Brunel, what do you think? Are some Democrats in denial over Hillary Clinton's problems? I believe they are in denial. And you know, when you've got the top person, the president, who's supposed to be the example for the nation, uh, telling us that this person is the most qualified with five <laughs> FBI bureau investigations, two open investigations, the Wiener pedophilia investigation, as well as the pay to play with the Clinton Foundation, as well as the emails reopen. When you've got our top president, person not saying step down, not, you know, leading and morality and ethics, why would you expect the rest of the party to fall in, you know, uh, to do the right thing? But what I would say is this, the Democratic Party has sent out people uh, to cause violence at rallies, that's been ratified. They have not uh, uh, given us any reason with this open borders through Hillary Clinton, with the Supreme Court picks that won't be conservative, with she's never created a private sector job in her life. Donald Trump has created over 60,000 private sector jobs okay. he's got so much so many reasons why he should be the next president and we're not in denial he's not in under investigation okay we're voting and for the one that's the not under investigation. and Brunel would know something about democratic politics she's not been a FBI she, investigation she's been a lifelong democrat uh jamu i want to ask you about this new abc washington post tracking poll that has just come out in the last half hour and what it shows is that donald trump now is regarded by more americans to be more honest and trust Trustworthy. And you got to figure part of that is regarding the, whole, the FBI stuff and everything we have learned from the WikiLeaks, which has been very embarrassing. Look, Secretary Clinton is the first person to say that she 